My name is Lacey Klein, and I work here at UJ Extension in Gwinnett, and we do all sorts of fun classes, and we were lucky enough to snag Olivia Minaj to talk about the A's and B's, or pun intended, um, of honeybees, keeping honeybees. And she's going to give us all sorts of valuable information on um, how to keep honeybees and all the fun things about them. I am facilitating today, so I'm going to make sure that everybody gets into here from the waiting room. And I am going to make sure that everybody is muted. And um, that way we won't uh, interfere with what Olivia has to tell us with the presentation. So just a few ground rules. As you listen to Olivia, you're probably going to have some questions, and that is perfectly fine. Um, we ask that you do not unmute yourself and ask that question. Uh, there's, there will probably be, by the time it's all said and done, 30 or 40 people on here, so that can be highly distracting. So please, if you have a question, just go ahead and type that in the chat box. You'll notice that that's down at the bottom. And as we get through to the end, she's got probably about 15 or 20 minutes left at the end of the hour, uh, the 45 minutes or so that she's got the uh, presentation for, and she'll take questions at that point. So I'll read whatever pops up in that chat box. Um, and then again, you can just go, if you have more questions, just type those in there and she will answer everything that is in that chat box and probably a little bit more. Uh, if your camera is not on, that is absolutely fine. Uh, you, when I record this, and, and it will be up on our Ma Metro Master Gardener channel, um, what you'll see is just Olivia on there. You're not going to see a picture of your smiling face, so that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it if you're not there. Um, the big thing to remember here is that if you are interested in the workshop portion of this, and she'll talk a little bit about that as we go through, there is an in-person workshop part two of this series where we will be over at Creative Enterprises off High Hope Road. And Olivia will actually crack into a hive, maybe, and she'll show us some honey. Um, you'll get to see the bees that they have over there. And no, you won't be handling the bees. Uh, you will be a safe distance away, which is just fine. We like it that way for liability purposes but you will learn a lot about um, bees and it's always fun to actually be there in person. That is a pun, <laughs> be there in person, get it? You'll be there in person so you can see uh, live bees in action and Olivia will kind of go through the care of the hive and, and all of that. So with all of that being said, I will go ahead and hand it over to Olivia. Um, other than that, just a quick little bio, you probably got that already. Olivia is a UGA master beekeeper, and she helps teach and manage honeybee colonies for homeowners, schools, farms, and businesses all across Northeast Georgia. So she has got a lot of knowledge to share with us, and I also consider her a friend, and I appreciate that she's here. So, Olivia, I'm going to hand it over to you, and I'm going to mute myself. Thank you, Lisa, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you guys for having me, and thank you so much for so many people that have signed up and are here. I'm really excited to be uh, to be talking to y'all. I love my master gardeners, and anyone else who's on, um, welcome. I'm happy to meet you, and I'm going to jump right into my presentation. I have uh, several slides. There's actually about 30 slides, but I hope they're really entertaining pictures and it doesn't feel like death by PowerPoint. Um, you know, bees are always fun to see in pictures. So hopefully we'll be, they'll be good and entertaining. And I've saved us maybe 20 minutes at the end for questions. So like Lisa said, please do not unmute yourself because there are so many of you on the presentation or in the Zoom today. Um, it can get really confusing if you unmute yourself and ask questions. So please type your questions into the chat box and I will save us some time at the end to go through some questions. I promise you that. So if you type it in the chat box, we will get to it. Okay, good. I have a timer started so that I will keep on time. So Lisa did a little introduction of me. I am Olivia. I'm a UGA master beekeeper. I've been keeping honeybees for about seven years, and I also keep mason bees and other native pollinators. 
So if you have questions about any bees, not just honeybees, I'm always happy to be a resource. And at the bottom of every slide I have, you'll see a link to my Instagram, a link to my Facebook. In both of those platforms, I post bee updates, flower updates, pollination updates. So if you are interested in host in having beehives or becoming a beekeeper, I would highly encourage you to follow definitely my Instagram or Facebook so that you can start to get a feel for what a beekeeper's year looks like. And you have me available as a resource to ask any questions if you have, uh, as you go through your journey. I am also a beekeeper for Monroe Area High School. Uh, if you look at the picture in the bottom center of my screen, you can see me with some of the teachers out at the Monroe Hives at their school. We've had 16 students go through a beekeeping class there, and I have many more that have joined me for different mentoring opportunities and uh, harvesting honey. You can see a bottle of the Hurricane Hives honey that they carry at the Monroe Farmer's Market around the holiday time in the bottom right. Uh, before becoming a beekeeper, I was uh, an aviation engineer, actually, with Delta Airlines. I retired from doing that in 2022 to become, uh, well, no, in 2020, I retired to become a full-time beekeeper. So now this is what I do, the beekeeping. So I figured we'd start with a little bit of honeybee biology just to go right into the like hard and difficult stuff. This is, a, this is a picture that I stole from a friend of mine, Lewis Bartlett, who is one of the entomology professors at UGA. And he posted this as an unscience and animal contribution to a Reddit journal. And I really thought this was adorable. So for those of you that are not familiar with honeybees, and Lisa, can you give me like a heads up, a nod or a, a shake your head? If Can you see my cursor on the screen? No? Okay, then I won't use it to point to things. I think there's a way, let's see here. Yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna be able, how about that? Can you see the pointer? Okay, good. <laughs> so for those of you that are not familiar with honeybees, this is some basic biology. They are, they are insects. They have wings or zoomy air arms here as Lewis likes to call them. They have fuzzy little bodies. They have huge eyes, so they see really well. And they have, um, they have a really long tongue that you can't quite see in this picture, but it is uh, it is out there. They have a very long tongue that they stick down into flowers to pull nectar up out of the flower. And a honeybee tongue actually functions kind of like a straw. So they insert the tongue into the flower and then they're, they're literally sucking the nectar straight into their um, honey stomach. And you can't see on the inside um, because that's kind of the really scary sciencey place on the inside of the bee. But I'll tell you one really cool fact about the honeybee's interior is they have a special honey stomach that's different from the stomach where they process foods. Their honey stomach is basically like a water bottle inside of their body that they can use to transport water or nectar anywhere they want to go. So when they're using their proboscis, their tongue, and their taking nectar out of a flower, it's actually going into this little honey crop or honey stomach that keeps it separate from all of the digestive juices that are going on in their body for their food and energy sources. And of course, we've got the danger bottom section, which on all of the female honeybees that we'll see out and about, we just have to be aware of. You know, they can sting. Uh, when a honeybee stings, she does die. She will typically leave her stinger and some of her guts on you if she stings you. So she really does not want to sting you. But as a last, uh, a last resort, she will sting you if she has to. Oh, and I should mention pollen too. The bees, when they're on flowers and they're collecting pollen, you can see in this picture how all of the pollen grains will stick to their legs, to their underbellies. They have fur all over their, their bodies, even on their chests, their, their little furry chests attract the pollen and then the bees will take their front four legs and they will push the pollen off of the furs on their body into what's what's a <laughs> it's actually called a corbicula on their back leg here but Lewis appropriately calls it the thunder thigh leg larder <laughs> and that is really just a little handbag attached to her back legs where she pushes all the pollen and it's it just makes the pollen stick there so that she can fly and bring it back to the hive. So that's honeybee biology 101. It's not too bad, right? So after what a bee looks like, 
you know, the next thing I think about is, well, what do bees eat? How do they operate, right? I mentioned that they have a honey stomach or a yeah, honey crop or honey stomach, but what they're actually using for their food source is the nectar that they're getting from the flowers. Bees will eat nectar and they will eat pollen. Mostly adult bees need the carbohydrates that come from the nectar. A typical honeybee is gonna live about three months in low work time during the heat of the summer, like right now when they are um, constantly foraging, they may actually only live you know, four to six weeks because they're gonna be out doing a lot of foraging right now. Uh, you now is the time of year when you might see swarms. You're going to see a lot of bees working any flowers that you see open. Uh, our nectar flow in this part of Georgia is just now tapering off. The main nectar sources that we have here are going to be your maple trees and then your tulip poplars and your privet hedges. And as of this week, I've seen just about the last of my tulip poplar leaves or flowers drop, and I really haven't seen too many privet uh, flowers this this week. So the nectar sources for the bees have really fallen off as of this week, which is about typical. Towards the end of June or the end of May, beginning of June, we, we will see the last of our nectar flow this for the year and the bees will be going into what's called a dearth. And for I had do have a slide in a minute that'll talk a little bit about what a honeybee cycle looks like throughout the year. But just need to understand if you are going to keep bees, that bees are making honey when they do have an active nectar flow in nature. And they're making that honey so that they have food stored in their hives to get them through the dearth. And in Georgia, our dearth will go all through June and July, probably August as well. So the hottest part of the year. And then in September, we'll get a second nectar flow through sources like goldenrod that will come out in the fall, but it can be very sparse in a lot of areas. So other than the main nectar sources between when our maples uh, flower in February, March, until the tulip poplars and privets drop at the end of May, that's really the time of year when our honeybees are getting all of the nectar that they need to make all of the honey that they need to survive the whole rest of the year. That's why they can be a little protective of their honey resources. So I mentioned that in addition to nectar, the bees also eat pollen. Now pollen is mostly not used by the worker bees. Pollen is mostly used by the, um, by the baby bees. And you can see that in this picture down here in the bottom. What bees do when they bring the pollen back to the hive, they're gonna mix it with some enzymes and they're gonna form it into what we call bee bread. And that, is what you're seeing in this bottom left picture is actually bee bread. And you can see it shows different colors. You can see uh, yellows and oranges, maybe some browns. And in nature, we'll see pinks, we'll see purples, we'll see all sorts of beautiful colors of pollen. And that gives us an idea of what our bees are actually foraging on. So if you see, you know, if I see a lot of yellow pollen in my in my colonies, then I know that maybe the bees are getting all one food source. But if I see a variety of colors, like I see yellows, I see oranges, I see pinks, maybe blues and purples, then I'm going to know that my bees are finding a good variety of food sources. And higher variety of food sources is always going to be better for the development and the growth of the bees than one single food source. For example, um, I don't know if you've seen about the almond pollination that goes on in California, but almonds are one of the crops that we would not have if it were not for if it were not for pollinators. And honeybees are used across the United States. They're packaged up and shipped out to California in uh, I think it's maybe February, March is the time frame when the almonds are pollinated, and it's a huge pollination event. And there is nothing else in bloom except except the almonds. So the bees that are sent out for almond pollination have access to no other food than the almond pollen, which is really great for the farmers because it encourages the bees to work the almond as hard as they can. But it's not so great necessarily for the bees that are there because they only have access to one food source. It would be like, me giving you bread and milk and telling you this is all you can eat for two months. Now, would you live? Yeah, you'd probably live. Would you love it and be super happy? Mm, you might not really feel like that's the best option. So 
I think for us as, as home beekeepers, it would be just good advice to make sure that you're watching the pollen that comes in with your honeybees so that you know that they have access to a good variety of foods. And if you're seeing just one color of pollen come in, I would start looking for other things to plant or other places to take the bees to make sure that they are getting a good variety of pollen and foods for themselves. So in the wild now, we've, we've talked about what bees eat, what bees look like, what bees are. Let's talk about where bees live. Uh, if we didn't manage colonies and we didn't set up hives, bees would still be here. They're not native to the United States. They are native to Europe and Asia, but bees are in the United States and they have been here since the 1700s or the 17th century. They've been here quite a long time. And in the wild, you will see bees living out in trees. So the original beehives that people used to use were like what's shown here on this slide. They were sections of trees that people would go out with a big saw and they would cut out the whole section of the tree. Typically it's a gum tree, like a Tupelo tree or in Georgia, black gums we'll see a lot or even sweet gums could be natural beehives because gum trees tend to, um, to rot. Their, their heartwood tends to rot out, it's very soft. It will rot or it will get eaten by bugs. So it will leave a hollow trunk and the bees will take up residence inside of that hollow trunk. So the earliest beekeepers in the United States would just cut sections of the tree out and they would have the bees. I mean, it's literally that easy. Here's another picture. Like this is an old picture from, I don't know, probably the early 1900s, if not late 1800s of a gum hive. And you can see it's just the tree section that was cut out. They'd put it on a stand so that it was a little easier to access. You can see better in the, in the original picture that they would probably cut a little bit larger hole that was big enough for a person to get their hand in, or they would put a roof over it to keep out rain, and then they could remove the roof and put their hand in and harvest out combs that way. So they're really just letting the bees build up their uh, comb inside of a tree exactly like they normally would. And then they would reach in and remove sections of comb. And here's just another cross section of a more recent one. We still find these today. Uh, if, you, if you are out in a neighborhood that has large old trees or even in national forests or parks, we have two national forests in Georgia. We have Oconee and Chattahoochee National Forest. I do a lot of hiking and wild bee hunting in those forests. And there are a lot of trees that have this sort of structure in them. Uh, some tree companies as well will contact me from time to time because they're cutting down a tree and they'll, they'll, they'll get just lit up by bees as they start to cut into a tree. So I have been able to work with some tree companies and Georgia Beekeeper Association does have beekeepers who are interested in getting those sections of trees that have the wild honeybee hives in them. So if you if you are ever around a tree, you're working with a tree, or you're even just hiking in a park and you think that there may be bees in a tree, I would love to hear about it if it's anywhere around Gwinnett County um, because we can either monitor that hive and make sure that wild hive is doing okay, or in some cases we're, we're able to um, harvest the hive and bring it into an apiary so that we can give them a safe place to live where we know people aren't going to spray them with chemicals or, you know, uh, pests aren't going to overrun them in the wild. So what's going on inside of that hollow tree where the bees living? This picture on the right is another picture of a wild beehive, but instead of cutting it cutting the tree like we normally would cut out a chunk at the bottom, this scientist, Dr. Seely, has been nice enough to also transect the, the hive by cutting it from the top to the bottom so that we can see a good cross section of what the honeybee hive looks like. Uh, Dr. Seely did this work back in the 70s. He has since um, stopped cutting the hives in half like this because he wants to preserve the hives like a lot of us do. But Dr. Tom Seeley wrote a lot of great work back in the 70s, 80s, and he is still doing great work today. His early work in the 70s and 80s, though, was all about cataloging what bees were doing in the wild. So if you do want to see uh, some really sciencey descriptions about, you know, the size opening that, bee hive, that bees want or the size cavities that bees prefer, the types of tree bees prefer. Uh, Dr. Tom Seeley is a great resource for that. And his, his name is right here, S-E-E-L-E-Y. 
He's a fantastic um, scientist. He's still in operation today. I was lucky enough to go to Cornell University last August and do some wild bee hunting with him. And he's going to be active for a very long time in the community because he's he's just an incredible professor and he does a lot of great work. So please do follow Dr. Tom Seeley if you are interested in learning more about honeybees in the wild. But this uh, picture on the left is an example of what a bee is going to do when left to their own devices in the wild. They're going to build a brood nest, which is where they're raising all their baby bees. About 10% of that brood nest will be drone comb, and the drones are the boy bees. The only purpose that the boy bees serve in a beehive is mating with the queens, and that purpose is only needed once a year maybe two or three times a year, depending on how, how large the colony is and how much they swarm. So typically no more than 10% of a, of a hive population will be drone brood. Uh, the rest of this brood nest is gonna be female worker bees, and they may try to lay one or two, three, just a few queen cells from time to time around the comb. Uh, typically a queen bee will live three to five years, the worker bees, like I said earlier, will live like maybe 60 to 90 days during working season. And the drones, they're just going to live until they mate and then they die at the mating process. So there really aren't a lot of queen cells typically in a hive, but bees will create queen cells if they know there's an issue with their queen that they may need to replace her or if they are about to split in a swarm process and the new swarm would leave with the old queen and the old bees would stay in the hive with the new queen. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides, the swarm instinct that we'll, we'll be fighting as beekeepers. But for now, where they live, they're building their large brood nest. They have a little bit of drone comb. They use what's called propolis to seal gaps in, in the wood and to, um, I don't know, dis, disinfect isn't the right word, but to keep out um, things like bacteria or mold, they will make a propolis envelope. And propolis is a tree sap product that bees chew out of the trees and then reprocess to make this um, propolis envelope around all around their hive where they need it. They're gonna store pollen right above the brood nest because like we learned in the last few slides, the pollen is used to feed the baby bees and then all the rest of the comb above the pollen will be honey stores. And that is to get the core bees through the winter dearth or the summer dearth, depending on what part of the country we're in. All right, I mentioned two different types of comb in the last segment, uh, talking about the brood nest, we have brood comb, and then above the brood comb, we have honeycomb. So on this slide, you can see an example of what the brood comb looks like. And typically beekeepers will use what are called deep frames. They're about nine and a half inches long or tall frames as brood frames. And then we have honey frames, which are about six inches tall. So the honey frames are intentionally a little shorter than the brood frames in our managed hives, mainly because we wanna leave the brood in the hive for the bees to manage and use. Brood is all baby bees. It'll be um, anything from eggs to larvae to pupa. Some of it's capped, some of it's open, depending on the stage of development, but the brood comb will always stay in the hive we want the baby bees to continue to grow and build the hive because we need a constant um, influx of eggs and larvae in order to replace all of the adult worker bees that are going to age out and die throughout the working season. So we always want to see brood in the hives year round. Um, the honeycomb is much lighter. We're typically going to give smaller frames mainly because they will be very heavy. Uh, honeycomb filled with honey, capped, ready to harvest, is just one frame, could be four to six pounds. And when you put 10 of those together in a medium box and you try to lift the box, the entire box is gonna be easily 40 pounds to lift. If we were to let the bees build out honey in the deep combs that are nine and a half inches tall, then a deep super filled with honey would, would weigh about a hundred pounds. And when I'm harvesting honey, I want to lift up that box and I want to take the whole box back to my honey house so that I can get the honey out. 
the medium frames that are going to weigh about 40 pounds are much easier for me to lift than the deep frames that would be about 100 pounds. So that's something to think about if you are in this class because you want to get into beekeeping, you're going to see deep and medium sized boxes sold. I like to use the deeps for the brood and I like to use the mediums for the honey. And all right, so early beekeeping, that was a little bit about biology. Now I wanna talk about beekeeping and how we've gotten to where we are in beekeeping. There are a lot of old records of ancient beekeeping practices. The oldest that's known is called, Le Co is, it's a cave drawing on a wall of a cave in Spain. It's called La Cueva de la Araña. And if you click, or I guess you don't click, if you use your phone camera, to open this QR code, you just point your phone camera at this QR code in the bottom right. It will take you to a link to a Spanish um, a tourist company that can tell you how to find this cave. So this, this drawing is still on the wall of this cave in Spain, the country Spain, so it's pretty far away. But this cave drawing was estimated to have been made uh, 6,000 to 5,000 years before Christ. So that's seven to 8,000 years ago. And you can see in the picture, there are little flying insects that look a whole lot like bees. And this crazy person on sticks is toting a little jar with them and sticking their arm into that, that dark hole of a beehive, just like we still do today, because they wanted that sweet honey. And I mentioned that bees were brought to the early Americas in the 17th century. So here we are thousand, a thousand plus years later, thousands of years later, and doesn't this picture look a whole lot like what was going on back 8,000 years ago? Like it took us 6,000 years, 6,000, almost 8,000 years to basically keep doing the exact same thing. Like in the United States in the 16 and 1700s, people were still climbing ladders, sticking their arms in, in holes to pull honey out. And I showed you the gum hives a few slides ago that well up into the early 1900s, that's still what people are doing. And there are still people that will do this today if we find wild hives out in the out in the trees. So, you know, if something's if something's broke, some people say don't fix it. But if a process works, you know, then, hey, if it works for you, keep doing it. But I will promise you there are better ways and easier ways to get honey out of beehives with today's modern equipment. Bees are documented and regular in um, Egyptian hieroglyphs even. They were used in Egypt. Bees were used in a lot of different rituals and honey was used as a sweetener and in medicine. And I think it's interesting that um, today we use granulated or cane sugar as our primary sweetener, but cane sugar really didn't come around until the 1500s, the medieval times. Prior to the 1500s, the main sweetener source for anyone worldwide was, um, was honey, and not North America. We had sorghum, but in honey was the main sweetener through most of the world up until the 1500s. Uh, wax was also used widely in cosmetics, painting, embalming. Today, there's even a, a really interesting form of art called encaustic art that uses beeswax and mica powder to color the beeswax to different tones. And then you paint by heating and melting and drying the wax in different designs. There's a book about Egyptian beekeeping practices called The Tears of Ray. And again, a QR code, if you use your phone camera and just look at that QR code, it will bring up the link for you to click. You don't have to take a picture of the code. You just look at the code with your camera and it will bring up a link for you to click. Uh, China has some of the oldest written records uh, from China, from China's culture were, on bone fragments, tiny bone fragments. I, I'm not exactly sure what kind of bones they were, but they're definitely bone fragments that are carved with different designs. And in this case, we see a lot of designs that definitely favor our little honeybees. They have little feet and wings, they're striped, they even have antenna. So the, the Chinese um, pictures 
for the honeybees are very detailed and they're they're very obvious when when you see bone fragments from the National Library or from other sources across the world. If you ever see old bone fragments um, talking about China's history, make sure to take a peek at them because the the honeybee, the fang and the mi fang are what these are called. The the designs they're they're quite distinguishable no matter where you see them. And the oldest beehives in the world today that you could conceivably see are actually in the Middle East. And in the bottom right of this slide, you'll see a QR code that will take you to an article talking about these. I think the article was in the Israeli Times newspaper. Um, these beehives, it's amazing that they have lasted as long as they have because they are made out of clay. So early beehives were either wood where they were the actual tree sections cut out and wood is not um, a durable product, right? Especially wood that's not been treated by anything, which is what beehives would have been in history. Uh, the, the wood will degrade, it will rot, bugs will eat it over time. It's just gonna disintegrate into nothing. Clay typically would do that as well. So it's really interesting that they found these clay beehives and these were solely used as beehives. You can see the sketch in the top right showing women and men working the beehives to get the honey out of them. Uh, this was potentially, well, it definitely wasn't the oldest apiary. I'm sure there were apiaries before this, but this is a very large scale collection of beehives that is has been dated to about 3000 years old. And it's uh, recently been excavated recently, like in the last 20 years been excavated. So this whole place was actually covered by dirt. The whole town was covered by dirt for who knows, hundreds of years, if not thousands. And in the course of excavating, archaeologists have unearthed these beehives. And this is a pretty cool development. Um, inside of some of the, the hives, they don't look like hives we think of, but the clay pots are the old hives. There's actually honeycomb. Now, I think it's arguable whether or not that honeycomb has been there for thousands of years or they've excavated it. And now immediately bees were like, hey, look, a whole new house for us to take up in and, you know, have new honeybees now in the area, discovered these hives and gotten into them and started building out new comb because bees know when they find a good house, that's where they want to be. They'll go there. So beekeeping, here's a nice uh, cycle. This is what the cycle of beekeeping looks like. First step is you wanna grow enough bees to create a swarm. You want to catch the swarm if at all possible. And in these pictures, the beekeepers have now uh, progressed into typical fifth century to eighth century beekeeping where they're using skep hives. Today, we don't use skep hives. We use Langstroth hives, which are wooden boxes, but these skep hives make a nice visual for what you're seeing in, these, um, in the process. So we grow enough bees to create a swarm. We catch a swarm. We're gonna rehome th that swarm in a new skep or a new hive. So you can see like the apiary here in the bottom that has a couple of hives. And then after we have rehomed the swarms, we're going to extract wax and honey from the old swarms. So as bee swarm, as bee hives go through the course of their year from, this is like a, a year calendar. It starts with January over here on the left and it goes through December on the far right. From like February when our maples start to bloom all the way through the end of May and into June, the bee colony is going to increase in size. So the, the chart here represents the population of the colony in a beehive. And this sun represents the summer solstice, which is gonna be around June 20th, June 22nd, I think this year. So our bee population will grow, 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 grow all the way until the summer solstice. During this spring reproductive cycle, our colony, one colony is going to grow her population, but if that population outpaces the size of the box or the size of the hive that they're in, then that colony will cast off a swarm. Now you may see swarms of bees around this time of year. It's just a cluster of bees, maybe the size of a softball. Sometimes they're a little bit bigger, but it is a cluster of bees that leaves the colony with the old queen because they have made a new queen and they have left the new queen back in the home colony to take over the reign. And the new queen and a large cluster of bees will go out and find a new home. 
So that is a bee's super, super organism level reproductive process. In addition to just making new bees to backfill bees that die off, they also cast out swarms. So one hive can create two, three, four, five, who knows how many hives throughout the course of its life cycle just by casting off swarms. So after we get to the summer solstice, the colony size is going to start to decline. We'll continue to have bees die off because they're still looking for food, they're gathering and storing food, but they're not gonna be finding nectar because we're in a dearth in Georgia from now until September for a small food in nectar source, but definitely until February when the maples come back. So it does not make sense for the bee population to continue to increase when they know there's no more food. So as the bees see the nectar sources dry up, they stop making as many babies and the colony population will drop, 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 drop until we get to a very small, maybe two or three frame cluster to get through winter. They get down to the smallest amount of bees that they need to survive winter. And that's usually a little cluster, two or three frames that will surround the queen and a small cluster of eggs, larvae and pupa so that as soon as they find food sources start in February, they can start to grow again. Pretty, they're pretty smart animals. They're incredibly smart animals. Okay, here is a one page just on what, what is happening inside of a traditional hive. So I talked a bit about what goes on inside of the trees. You know, they have the brood, col they, they have the brood comb, the brood nest where they're raising babies. They store their honey up above. As beekeepers, we stack boxes. The boxes on the bottom, one or two, will typically be a brood nest. And then we will stack one, two, three, as many boxes as we need to, to give the bees space to store their honey. Typically, we're putting the finished honey at the top and we're giving them new frames right above the brood comb because they want to store honey right above the brood comb. And we don't want them to have to work really hard to store their honey. Why would I take a bee who's working her entire life to make as much honey as she can. And I would make her walk all the way up here to the top of the boxes to put new honey in when I can just put new space for her right here above her brew comb so she can come in the hive, she can store her honey, and then she can leave her hive and go out and forage some more. So that's basically what's happening inside of a beehive. Oh, and the queen will always want to expand upward. So she's going to start building, start laying eggs in the bottom, and she's going to build upwards. So we do need to keep that in mind, too, because if we let her go unchecked, she would lay eggs in our honey. So there is some management that we have to do to keep the queen and the eggs in the bottom boxes so we can keep our honey in the top boxes for clean harvest. So beekeeping today can look like a lot of different ways. You know, there are bee beehives in China that are built in a very special way in this, you know, I can't say this very well, but the Shinonjiga, <laughs> it's a valley where they know that there is a prime nectar source that blooms a certain time of year, like our sourwood in Georgia. It's, it's a very desirable nectar source. So the beekeepers will put these hives right on the wall of the valley to take advantage of that nectar source. In Africa, they have to um, suspend their hives on sticks because they have such bad ants. The ants will get in and kill all the bees. They will chase all the bees out of the hives. So they take all sorts of precautions, even suspending their beehives to keep the ants out of the hives. They use agave log hives in, in parts of Africa, just like we would use our gum tree hives still today here in America. And uh, I use Langstroth hives. So just like in the picture I showed on the last slide with the boxes building vertical, that's this is a picture of my apiary in the top right and some of my Langstroth hives. So a little more detail about the specific equipment that you're going to most often see here. And by no means do you have to be limited to this equipment. This is just what typically you're going to see in the United States. This is what's called a Langstroth hive. We'll use a, a bottom board. The purple section here is a bottom board. It can be either screened or solid. Screened is just ventilated so you get better airflow in the summer. And um, the screens are, are arguably better at not letting other pests like small hive beetles or varroa mites infest your hives. 
because the screens give the bees a place to push the pests so that they can't get as good of a foothold in the hive. But there are cases where you would prefer a solid board on the bottom. And then we have hive bodies. I mentioned you may have one or two brood boxes, a brood box where the queen is gonna lay her eggs and the bees are gonna raise their brood is typically called a hive body. On most of my hives, I run two hive bodies because two deeps is plenty of capacity to allow my bees to survive year round. I don't harvest anything out of these two boxes. I give the girls two full deeps and they can live off of that year round. Anything they put in any higher boxes is going to be honey that I can harvest and it's surplus. They're not going to need it to survive for the winter. So I feel very comfortable taking that. Above the honey, the honey um, supers, we put a telescoping cover just to keep out the rain. It's called telescoping because the side of the hive body is like this and the telescoping lid covers it like this. I don't know if you can see, I hope you can see that. See where my eye is, that little gap where my eye is? That's like uh, an overhang. So when it rains on the cover, the rain goes out and it cannot get inside of the hive. So that's why it's called a telescoping cover. Inside of the telescoping cover, there's an inner cover that includes some vents. So it basically works like a chimney where it will vent air up and through the hive and the air can come out the holes at the top and out this little hole at the back. And that's how the bees get airflow through the hive so that they're not living in a little box that runs out of oxygen and they would all die because the bees need an environment rich with oxygen so that they can breathe just like we do. Uh, quick overview on that equipment. One hive on current rates with some of the local suppliers is going to cost you about $520 just for the woodenware that you would need and the frames. So it's about $520 for one hive. One hive runs the risk for new beekeepers of potentially um, having an issue and not realizing you're having an issue. So I like to recommend that you always have at least three hives so you can resource share between those hives. That's going to put you at about $1,500, $1,600 startup cost for three hives. And that's not counting personal protective equipment you might need, your smoker, hive tools, frame rests, honey processing equipment, educational materials like books, a club membership. I would highly recommend you join the Gwinnett Beekeepers Club if you're interested in bees. Uh, Gwinnett Beekeepers is also a member of the Georgia Beekeepers Association. We have a great state association with two conferences a year. The Georgia Beekeeper Association next conference is September 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and it will be held in Gainesville. So it's very close to us and it's a great location. They have world-class speakers coming in. So if you have the opportunity or any interest in additional information, check out the Georgia Beekeeper Association fall conference or the Gwinnett Beekeepers. They meet monthly. Gwinnett Beekeepers meets monthly the second Tuesday of every month at Hebron. It was Hebron Baptist Church, but I think they're moving to the school now. But you can check them out on Facebook. Uh, Gwinnett, the Beekeepers Club of Gwinnett is what they're called. Great group of folks. Uh, if you factor in all of the club memberships, honey processing equipment, personal protective equipment, just to get into beekeeping, now you're looking at a price tag around $2,600. It gets pretty high. And then if you want to take steps to prevent pests in your hives, which I highly recommend, and if you want to go fancy with some of your bottling, like my Monroe Area High School kids like to do with um, glass bottles, custom labels, you can do some pretty uh, design decorator items to hang on them. You know, the cost for beekeeping can get pretty excessive pretty quickly. So be mindful of what you wanna do before you start buying things for your bees because it can get out of hand really quickly. Other considerations for your beekeeping would be liability. Um, this bottom picture is my niece when she was three years old. She's visited some beehives with me and you can see she's standing right in front of the hives. These were active hives. This is the hive entrance. Uh, just by doing something as simple as putting chain link in front of the hives or chain link with some windscreen if folks are super nervous, that will encourage the bees to fly out of their hives and up and over the fence. So you can stand right in front of them and watch what's going on. I still never really recommend standing directly in front of a hive. I would always recommend standing a little bit off to the side um, just for your own safety. 
but these can be very safely viewed in public or in your backyard. This top picture is a botanical garden. I think it's the coastal Maine botanical garden. And this is a really pretty educational display, but some of these honeycombs where you see the trees through are cutouts that have uh, very fine hardware cloth in them. So you can view their beehives through the protective screen behind the safety of the hardware cloth. And on the hexagons that are not the viewing portals, they have all sorts of educational materials. So it's really cool. So think about when you're setting up your hives, the liability of how you want to view your hives. You don't want to get hurt. You don't want spectators to get hurt. You don't want your neighbors to get hurt. So be thoughtful about where you place your hives. And you may want to consider insurance, general liability, third party, premise, bodily injury, or product insurance if you're going to be producing honey or wax products. I don't expect you to read this whole slide. I just like to throw all those words on there for shock value. But there is a unified development ordinance in Gwinnett County that specifically talks about bees, and it gives you some really great advice on how to keep your bees, where to keep your bees, how to keep your neighbors safe. Here's one of those fancy QR codes that takes you to uh, one page on keeping bees and chickens in Gwinnett County. And I think I have this printed somewhere. We are really lucky in Gwinnett County that our administrators recognize the value of access to fresh eggs and fresh honey. And several years ago, they put that ordinance in place and the one page, make sure it's right side up. The one page looks something like this. This is what the QR code takes you to. And it gives you just a one page cheat sheet on keeping chickens and bees in Gwinnett County so that you can have access to fresh eggs and honey. And even if your lot size is only a quarter of an acre, it is legal for you to keep bees in Gwinnett County. Another group to consider is statewide, right? We have statewide laws as well as county laws. The Georgia Department of Agriculture has put out these different laws. Again, you don't need to read all the words on this slide. Here's a QR code. The QR code will take you to the official code of Georgia annotated title two, chapter 14. Article three is specifically about honeybees. There are some regulations, mostly about transporting bees across state line where you could, um, you could bring disease in or take disease out of Georgia. And we want to minimize that as much as possible. Um, if you do a violation of the state laws, there could be penalties up to $500 or six months in the county jail. So I highly recommend reading these Georgia Department of Agriculture regulations and making sure you're not violating any of them. And lastly, I want to make sure that we're being good neighbors. Your homeowner association or your community may have more restrictive ordinances than what Gwinnett County has. Um, bees can be considered livestock or insects, but regardless, if you're hosting beehives on your property, you could be considered to be running a business. If you're selling products on your property, there could be rules associated with selling products. There could be rules for your community associated with running a business. Just take a look at your community rules or your HOA um, covenants and restrictions before you, before you jump right into your beekeeping hobby. And a few ways you can help bees. I have three little takeaways and then we can wrap up. Uh, plant pollinator plants, please. The best food that you can plant for a bee is a flowering tree. From a maple to a tulip poplar, flowering trees will provide a longer bloom cycle and more blooms per plant than any flower you could ever plant. But there are some really beautiful pollinator plants that you can plant. Um, one of my favorites is bee pollen. Um, Monarda right now is, uh, is a really popular one, but the State Botanical Garden in uh, Athens puts out a really nice list of some different pollinator plants. And at the extension, the UGA extension plant sale every year, they typically have some great pollinator plants available as well. Whether you want to host bees yourself or keep bees yourself, you can get a Georgia honeybees license plate. And it's so pretty. If you scan the QR code in the bottom right, you can see some information. 
the uh, Georgia Bee license plate funds, the proceeds go to the Georgia Beekeepers Association, and we use those funds to run educational programs at schools and parks all around the state. Um, my club hosts hives at the Gainesville Botanical Gardens, so if you'd like to come up and see some public hives in Gainesville, we have them at the Children's Garden and just outside of the Welcome Center, thanks to the Honey Bee license plate program. And then please participate in the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. Lisa will send you tons of information on this as we get closer to August. If you haven't done it before, we're happy to answer any questions you have. And then that's my last slide. Please sign up for the in-person event June 16th, or sorry, the in-person event is Saturday, June 17th. You can use the orange QR code on this slide to, um, to fill out a form to sign up, or you can email Laura Tierney. We're just asking that you please register by the Friday before. That would be June 16th. I'd love to see you there. Awesome. Um, so talk a little bit, if you will, about how we sign up for part two. How we sign up for part two. Okay, the orange code, the orange QR code on the left of the slide here, if you will scan that, uh, it will take you to a Google questionnaire. There's like a Google sheet that you just fill out. I think it just asks for your name, first name, last name, and email address. That will put you on the list. Laura Tierney has the official sign up and she will send you a confirmation that you're on the list. And when you get there, Saturday, June 17th, we will go out, take a look at the hives that we've installed at Creative Enterprises. I can talk a little bit about different beekeeping equipment. I will have my equipment there so you can see it, feel it, touch it, ask any questions. I will plan to crack open a hive and um, pull a couple frames. And if the bees are being cooperative, we may get to pass those around and take a look at some brood so you can see that in person. And I have already pulled a few frames of honey so we can all do a little bit of honey extraction and see what that's like. That's awesome. I'm excited. <laughs> that's why this job is, is so much fun because we get to do fun stuff like this and learn while we're, uh, while we're at it. Okay. Did I leave enough time for some of the questions from the chat box? We have a few. Um, so uh, I know I see some, some questions popping in there now. So if you have specific questions about any part of what Olivia has shared, go ahead and just stick that in the chat box now. And if anything pops in your head while we're going through and answering the questions, feel free to stick that in there. Um, okay, so starting out, uh, everyone complains about sweet gum trees, but it looks like they once served a purpose. Um, <laughs> yeah, they do have pretty fall color. <laughs> they they do have pretty flowers. They're not great. Sweet gums aren't great food for bees, but the rotten cores are great homes for bees. If you want to plant a tree that would make a great dual purpose potential future home and great food now, I would probably go with a black locust tree, the, the gum trees. They're also gum trees, so they have the potential for forming future homes, but the black locust makes great uh, food. Their flowers make great food for bees. Definitely better food than the sweet gums, but yeah, sweet gums, they do have a purpose, but I still cut most of them down because those balls are awful. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, we have a few teachers on here. So Nicole Moore at Mesa Elementary said, yes, we are planting now. Um, I think that was, she put that one in about most of the way through your um, presentation. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, can you please share your Instagram name again? And will we get a copy of the slideshow today? So um, because we weren't folks who took the time to attend this particular Zoom um, to get an opportunity to uh, register. Don't So the slide you see right now, go ahead and hover over that, show me those honeybees Saturday, June 17th QR code uh, to get that sign-up link uh, because what we're doing is we want the folks who taken the time out of their schedule to get first dibs on attending that. So that's in a couple weeks um, on Saturday. So go ahead and hover over that now if you think you might want to. Um, yes, Olivia is zooming around it right now. Um, hover over that and pull that link up and save that link if you think you might want to attend um, so that you can do that. I'm going to hold off on posting this for a bit because uh, either that or I'll remove that section from the back part 
of the presentation because like I said, I want folks who took the time out of their schedule to come here because we just have limited um, numbers that can attend them so that um, everybody gets an opportunity to kind of get close and see what's going on. Nobody likes being stuck at the back of a, a group of 40 people where you can't hear anything, that's no fun. So we want everybody to, to be able to participate and ask questions and, and, and get close. Um, all right, and uh, so let's see. So I think she asked also about my Instagram. Yeah, and you can put that, that in the chat box if you wanna do that. That way everybody can get access to that. Well, um, it's here on the slide. It's just oh. OM. Dot bees. I'm, I'm highlighting it now. And if you are interested on getting um, updates about any of the honey, or I, may, I also make soaps and different lotions, um, you can get updates when I have products available by scanning this QR code in the bottom. But for beekeeping tips, my Instagram is om.bees, and it's also on the slide here. And Lisa, can I say, I think you said the last person who asked a question was from Mason Elementary, and I'm pretty sure I saw Janet Vergara on the on the attendee list. So hi, Janet. Thank you for joining. Uh, I think that we're going to be doing a great Georgia or a great Southeast pollinator census prep with the Mason Elementary kids at the beginning of next school year. So if you, um, whoever that teacher is that was asking that question, if you want to reach out to me to make sure that you're part of that discussion, uh, just message me through Instagram, Facebook, or this is my cell phone and my email as well. And I'm, I'm happy to make sure that you get included in the discussion. And, you know, I sometimes I just take a screenshot of stuff like this. That way you can come back to it later uh, or you can reach out to me and I can get you in contact with Olivia also. All right, moving along. Um, do all bees have a corbicula or just honeybees? Ooh, that is such a great question. No, not all bees have corbicula. Um, corbicula is that pollen basket on their back leg. And that uh, corbicula presence is, uh, is an identifying factor that is really important in deciding whether you're looking at a carpenter bee or a bumblebee. Because carpenter bees, which we all know have the shiny hiney, where bumblebees have a furry hiney, sometimes they can kind of look the same, especially if it's a dead bee and they are maybe a day old and you aren't quite sure, is that really a fuzzy hiney or is that a shiny hiney? Um, the corbicula that is on, let's see, I always get it mixed up. <laughs> Say it again. Bumbles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The corbicula is, I'm pretty sure on the carpenter bee where the bumblebee does not have a corbicula, but I could have that backwards. But a corbicula does not occur on every single bee. And if you're looking at something that you think is a carpenter bee or a bumblebee, the presence of the corbicula is one of the things that you use to decide which is which. Okay. That's a great question. <laughs> All right. I have seen honeybee bread for sale on Etsy. Why is it so expensive? Honeybee bread? Wait, what's that question again? I have seen honeybee bread. So basically the, the stuff that's... Um, that, that, the, the pollen that they're putting into the, you had mentioned it, I don't know, about way through. They've seen it for sale on Etsy and they wanted to know why that was really expensive. You know, they break down and sell different types of honeybee products. Well, I didn't, I haven't seen bee bread for sale yet, but that doesn't mean that it's not out there. I mean, you can buy royal jelly, you can buy bee pollen. I'm sure someone's selling bee bread. Um, bee bread is basically bee pollen that has some of the nectar mixed in with it to make a really high, highly nutritious food for baby bees. So I would expect if, if someone were selling bee bread, then it, it should be looked at kind of like bee pollen for the benefits that you would get from the raw bee pollen. But you're also getting a little bit of the natural nectar and the bee enzymes that you would get out of honey as well. Um, I haven't seen bee bread specifically as a product, but that's interesting if someone's taking the time to, to harvest it. I probably wouldn't pay much more for that than I would for just bee pollen, though. Here's a question for me about that. So if you're seeing that, obviously that would be for baby bees. Um, is that robbing them of their food source? And should you kind of give it the side eye because that's not good? Can you take that away from the 
That's an interesting ethical question, Lisa. And there, you know, beekeeping practices differ from beekeeper to beekeeper. Um, I mentioned that typically I don't take any honey unless it's in the boxes that are above my brood box. So I, I just personally choose not to rob any resources from the brood box whatsoever. Uh, I have a means to harvest pollen by putting traps at an entrance or at the top of the hive, and bees will tend to bring surplus pollen into those two areas. So when I harvest my pollen, it's, it's not coming out of the brood box. If the bees go into the brood box and they're using anything in the brood box, that is something that they need for the winter. And just statistically, um, USDA has done a lot of research since the 1920s about the overwintering of bees because of their benefit and their, um, their benefit to pollination of agricultural crops across the United States. And it's been determined that in the Southeast, bees need one deep super plus one medium super as a brood area undisrupted all the way through the year. Where up in the Midwest, where temperatures get colder, they need two deep supers. So that's 200 pounds of resources. Uh, just because that research is out there and we know that that is the amount of space they need, one deep and one medium, I choose to not get into that area. But you can get into that area, you can harvest, and there are supplements just like with people, right? If we don't eat all of the foods and all of the vitamins and minerals we need to, we can take vitamin supplements, and we can restore some of that. There is supplemental food, supplemental pollens that you can get for bees. That's like a soy protein or some other protein derivative, but it's not the same thing as the bee eating that resource that they brought in themselves. They'll, yes, they'll survive on it. It's not going to kill the bees. They will survive just like you can feed them sugar syrup instead of them having honey and they will survive, but that's, it's the difference of you eating a protein bar versus eating a steak or you eating a vitamin versus eating a salad. You know, it's, <laughs> you can survive, but is it the best thing for you or that species? You know, maybe. Yes, I would Everyone say to the side. Take a, a, a vitamin versus eating a salad. <laughs> I know a lot of <laughs> the bees might say the same thing. I don't know. Maybe they really like the soy protein people feed them, but. <laughs> All right, uh, can chickens and bees both be on the same property, approximately one acre? If so, are there risks to either? Can they? Yes, bees and chickens can both be on the same property. I have bees and I have chickens, and they actually supplement each other really well because I mentioned earlier the varroa mites that prey on the, the honeybees. Uh, I can do something called drone brood trapping where I... I break off some of the drone brood every year and I freeze it to kill the varroa because varroa tends to be mostly attracted to the drone brood. So I freeze it for about two days to kill the varroa. And then I just toss that drone brood comb out to my chickens. And it's like, I have just thrown them a pile of larvae. So if you've ever given your chickens like mealworms, oh, baby bee larva that's been frozen is even better than mealworms to chickens. They go absolutely bonkers for it. And also the small hive beetles that get into honeybee hives have to pupate in the ground. So the beetles lay their eggs in the hive and then the eggs hatch and the larvae, the pupa like come out, the larvae come out and cr like crawl down the hive and dump down into the dirt. If you have chickens near your beehive, the chickens will scratch up and watch as that larva comes out and they eat up that small hive beetle larva. So there's nothing to pupate over, over winter and you won't have more small hive beetles next year. The okay. restriction could be with the Gwinnett County rules or your HOA ordinance. So please make sure you check with your HOA and read through that one page, bees and chickens from Gwinnett County and make sure you're legal for what you're trying to do. That's very interesting about the chickens. Um, I didn't think about that, but yeah, chickens are, are excellent at uh, scavenging insects. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Do we have anything else here? Let's see. One of the people singing your praises, Olivia. Um, let's see. How can you keep bees away? Uh, this is from Deputy Perez over at the Fresh Start Jail Garden. At our jail, our, our, the dog yard has lots of bees and our dogs are allergic. So is there a way to dissuade them from going to certain areas? Oh, dogs are, are kind of unique. I think you can probably see my little critter back here. And she is, um, 
she's not a fan of the bees and it is tough with dogs and bees. It's not as easy as with chickens and bees. Bees are pre-programmed to, um, to know that things like bears come to their hives and knock their hives over and steal all of their resources. And our dogs look very much like bears. And our dogs are also very curious. And if your dog, like mine, likes to walk up and look right at the entrance and see what's going on inside of that box, then your dog will get stung. Um, dogs are not typically allergic like they're, they're not going to have an anaphylactic reaction that could kill them, but bee stings are going to make your dog's ears swell up, your dog's nose swell up, your dog will likely bite at the bees, their whole mouth will swell up. It's not a comfortable situation for the dogs or the bees. Um, the best advice I could give for dogs and bees is like you've got nice hives and you've got not nice hives. And I have had hives before that I just could not have on my property because the bees would always go after my dog. If my dog was in the backyard and my bees were in the front yard, the bees would find the dog and chase her down. So I have requeened those hives or relocated those hives to other yards and either moving or requeening hives can sometimes settle them down. Now I only keep at my house the hives that are a little more tolerant of the dogs, but I also don't let the dogs go right up to the hives. So if you're finding that you're getting bees coming to where your dogs are, then I think we need to figure out where the bees coming from. Are they a local beekeeper or are they in a, um, are they a wild hive out in a tree somewhere? And what can we do about either requeening or rehoming the bees that are causing the problem? Is there a specific problem happening now or is this a, pre is this a preventative question? You're thinking through the risks if you brought bees to your place? It looks like they have some that are coming, that are visiting. Now they don't have hives out there that I'm aware of, um, but they are around, I guess. So there must be a beekeeper in the area. Um, I would love to hear more about this. Can she, can she message me directly after this session and let's have a yeah, conversation? Okay, because also, um, Bee activity is very seasonal, like I mentioned, and right now, since we're at the end of the nectar flow, we're starting to go into a dearth. You are going to see bees coming into places where you're not used to seeing them because they did have a great food source. Now it's drying up, so they have tons of workforce out there to harvest the nectar, but there's less nectar, so they are exploring all kinds of places to find what food opportunities are out there. That activity will die down over the next two to three weeks, but this is the time of year now through mid-June that it's going to be a lot of bee activity everywhere. I, I wonder, because Creative Enterprises is actually, as the bee flies, not very far away from the, the jail garden. Yeah, so I was thinking that too. That's why I want to talk to her yeah. after this session. We I might need to do some investigating. On that. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Perez, we'll we'll get to you. I'll I'll talk. We'll talk off off screen here and figure out what's going on. Um, does anybody else have any questions about bees in general? Maybe one quick question. I know there's different types of honeybees, Italian and then, and things like that. You've mentioned sometimes bees can get cranky and they don't want you messing with them. Are there particular uh, like, a like, for instance, like Italian honeybees, are those the ones of choice because they tend to be more docile or do we have other types of bees that, you know, would be better suited for backyard beekeeper? Are there, is there any, anything you can give information wise on that or is it just kind of a look of the draw? No, that's a great question. There are bee um, beekeepers that breed specific lines for their um, for their gentle behavior. Italians are a good example. Uh, you you will see when you start shopping for bees, you will see that you can buy like specific races of bees, like Carniolans or or Italians or Russian bees, German bees, whatever the type of bees. Um, there's a lot of DNA research that's being done right now on these different strains or, or races of bees, and they're finding that they really are all very similar. The DNA on them is ha has specific markers that may show genetic differences from generation to generation. Some bees, whether they're Italians or, or Russians, may have a more gentle behavior in their DNA than other bees. 
Uh, it, I think it's something that just as a beekeeper, you have to start to become familiar with which hives are being nice and which hives are not, which is also why I mentioned why I recommend that you get maybe three hives instead of just one, because you would then be able to compare and contrast to know what's aggressive behavior versus what is more comfortable laid back behavior. Some hives really are just very angry. Other hives are just very calm. And honestly, I see a correlation between the good demonstration calm bees are not always the best honey producers. They're like, they're good to be around. They have a nice demeanor. They are, they're great for demonstration. They build up enough resources to keep themselves, but they don't build a whole lot of surplus honey every year where you might have uh, another another queen or another hive that's very aggressive and they may put out a hundred pounds of honey extra a year. So I, I think personally, there may be a correlation between the hoarding, the honey hoarding behavior and the, the calmness or the gentleness of the bees. But, you know, just like with people, bees are diverse. People are very diverse. We all have different traits. And as a beekeeper, you're going to have to start to recognize what these different traits are and work with the traits you want and don't work with the traits you don't want. And that's where selective breeding comes in, whether it's chickens, goats, miniature donkeys, or bees, you know, selective breeding builds an overall better stock um, for everyone. So just keep that in mind. That's kind of why I say bees are a type of livestock, really, from that perspective. And you're going through three or four generational cycles in a year with those bees, but your queen is really the one that determines those traits. So if your queen is, is generating bad traits, three years from now, if you still have that same queen, that's still the same queen laying the same eggs, you're still getting bees with the same traits. You're not gonna train bees to be different in their 60 day lifespan. That's very interesting that bees have, that just like breeding horses or any other farm animal, that you can do that with bees too. I don't. I think people just think of them as insects, and they are all the same, but they're not. They have distinct characteristics that the queen passes on to her offspring. And that's actually pretty interesting. And I know there's so much more, and I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to hold those because um, we're at about quarter after yeah. one now. So um, you know, last call for anybody out there that has a quick question for Olivia. Otherwise. Um, there'll be time if you want to sign up for the workshop to ask her all sorts of questions. Um, there is so much more about the actual management part of the hive that she just didn't have time to go into here. And that's why we tried to break it into two parts. One where you can learn a little bit about the history and all the cool stuff about bees. And then the second part where you get the actual hands-on management part where you can really kind of dive into and ask some good questions and feel a little more comfortable about taking that leap if you guys want to get hives of your own. Um, so we all good, all good on the questions and, and everybody's got that QR code. If you missed it, um, hit me up at the office and I can get you the link to sign up in that Google spreadsheet. And um, otherwise, I think that's basically it. Thank you so much, Olivia. It was a lot of really good information. And this will show up um, on our Metro Master Gardener YouTube channel. Um, it'll just be a little delayed because we want to give everybody an opportunity to actually get signed up for the workshop. So I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and end it. And again, if you want to get connected with Olivia, if you missed that, just um, email me here. Uh, you can connect through the office email or if you have my email and I will get you connected with Olivia. Thank you very much. Everybody, thanks for showing up. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you all. I appreciate you having me. Okay, bye.